Welcome everyone to the uh, <laughs> to the uh, Carpenter Ant Awareness Week webinar with our wonderful panelist tonight is John Fleming. John is a software engineer. He's a technology in industry executive and entrepreneur as well. He's also the founder and CEO of Publisher Cloud. Publisher, P-U-B-L-I-S-H-R dot cloud, which provides sales and marketing platforms and services for publishers and authors. He is a regular contributor to the DBW Expert Publishing Series, a mentor at Startup FIU, and a member of the Florida Authors and Publishers Association. Welcome, John. Hey, Ginger. I'll give you the floor. How's everybody doing tonight? We've got the recording on, right, Ginger? I just want to check. Yes. I know we had a little problem with that last night. All right. Well, I'll, uh, I'll share the screen and we'll bring the presentation up and get started here. That's sharing okay, Jen? Oh, there we go. I don't see the it yet. There, there we go. How's that now? That's much better. Cool. All right. And well, if you, um, if good you evening, have everybody, questions. and let's get started. We're uh, tonight. We're going to talk about um, optimizing your online presence, with a particular focus uh, on your um, on your website. But we'll also talk some about your social channels and your email list and all the things that kind of go into that. Uh, start. Let's make sure this thing is on. The, the first place we start is actually not technical. Um, a lot of what we'll talk about tonight are really technical facets of how you do this stuff uh, and some of the real kind of down and dirty of things you need to check. But the, the place that you have to start to make all this work is really to define who your audience is. And when we talk about that, we're really talking about really identifying your target audience, understanding their demographics, really researching what appeals to them. You want to find out, you know, where they go, when they go there, whether that's real world places or virtual places. Um, one of the things I find, we work a lot with authors and publishers, and you would think in the publishing industry, the first thing that people would do is write things down, but in the trade, they seem, if they're not like writing the book itself, particularly immune to doing that. But we do find it very helpful if you really start to write this down because a lot of what you think you know in your head when you try to write it down and get it concrete, it turns out to, to be a lot less clear than maybe you thought and, and maybe some holes in what you thought weren't there. So you want to really kind of write down, you know, who you think they are, what the demographics are, you know, kind of what appeals to them. And once you've identified them, you want to really get down and kind of start showing up where they are whether that's you know on Facebook, on a social channel, at an industry event, maybe a real world event, um, really listening. Um, one of the mistakes we see people make a lot when they get online is they just start talking right away and they don't really listen and connect. Uh, we think you need to really kind of kind of do that and then kind of revise it, you know, because you're going to have something wrong in what you you, you get. Um, you can't sell whatever it is you're trying to sell, whether that's yourself, your books. Um, whatever your business is, your services, um, you'll probably be a little bit off and you'll find that you want to revise that and go ahead and go through the cycle. So an important part to, to really getting the whole kind of online thing right is to really make sure you've understood who is it you want to talk to. The next piece is, you know, a lot of times when we talk about online, you hear about keywords. That's almost the first thing that people talk about because obviously search is so important. Um, one of the things that we find a lot when we're working with authors and publishers is um, the keywords they have in their head are kind of about them and not necessarily about the way their audience talks. And sometimes you have to shift because you might not really be a complete member of your audience, although it helps if you are. So you really want to try to shift your keywords to understand kind of how they talk. Um, this is, this is, you know, for, for those of you who aren't in kind of the publishing industry, you'll find this a little publishing oriented, but I think it applies no matter what businesses you're in. 
you really want to kind of think like a reader. Think about if you were searching for your book, how would you search if you were customers, right? You want to talk to people you know and ask them, how would they search? Like, what are they going to look for, right? They might not be looking for your specific title or for you as an author name. They might. That's good if they do. But they may be looking for a kind of story or a kind of trope, you know, or some other definition. So it's important to kind of really think about that and understand it. One of the, the best places we see to really find, you know, kind of information about how people talk about books is to go to Amazon or Goodreads and look for reviews of your book. And if you don't have a lot of reviews of your book, of competitive books. Because in those reviews, you're going to see how people talk about a book like yours, the kinds of nouns, verbs, adjectives I use. That's pretty important. Same thing on your Facebook page, on fan groups. You want to you want to look at kind of the questions that get asked and, and particularly not just yours, but comparables, you know, look at how that, you know, what they ask and how they answer. Um, as you build the list of keywords, you know, what you want to start to then try to do is combine them in the most logical order. So, for instance, um, if someone was interested in military science fiction, that's what they're going to ask about. They're probably not going to look for fiction, science, military. And sometimes when we kind of do these phrases, you know, we get hung up on words and we do the phrases, we really kind of lose it a little bit. And for those of us who are in publishing, you know, the objective we usually have when people are kind of thinking about the keywords to appeal to their audience is really to develop a set of five to 10 keywords, keyword phrases that you're going to use. Amazon, which is, you know, the primary outlet for most authors, you know, it's going to probably represent, you know, at least 50% of your sales, maybe more for most authors, for many publishers, let you load seven. So you want to kind of take your top seven, put them there. And then as you're selling your book, adjust. It may be that based on what's going on in the world, how things see you changing, you want to adjust that list a little bit, take some of the lower ones and move them up and start using them. But that's how we think you should kind of build that list. That, that all kind of makes sense. The, the third piece, and again, this is very much applies to publishing, but it really applies to any business. Um, you know, this is a, an old Ogilvy quote that when I first learned marketing, um, I, I kind of get it, which is, you know, if it doesn't sell, it's not creative. Um, so, you know, the, the real question is when you're writing copy about your book or your products, whatever, are you writing copy that sells? In the case of books, there's really kind of three things that we look for authors to have. I know we have a couple authors who are who are watching the presentation, so I think I kind of ask you, you don't have to answer now, but I can ask you to think about, do you have each one of these? So the first is, do you have the elevator pitch for your book? Now the elevator pitch is not the book blurb. Book blurb is important and it has a lot of uses, but the elevator pitch, you know, the, this is the classic, you're in an elevator, you have 60 to 90 seconds, and someone says, oh, tell me about that. And can you tell me about that really clearly? So, so this is a place where, again, if you're talking about a book or a series or a set of work, you want to be really succinct about what it is, who it's for, what benefit they get from it, right? And the elevator pitch, again, you know, you're really talking, you know, um, this is the kind of 140 character tweet, you know, this is, you know, maybe a little longer than that, the sentence or two that talks about what you are. The second is a book blurb. I'm going to talk about that in a little more, but this is how you describe your book, right? This is the thing that people are going to see when they visit your site, when they visit an online store to get more information about the book. And the third element, really important, and this reflects back a little bit on the elevator pitch, but also a little different, is the search description. What are you going to load into your site and into the online stores for the search engines to pick up so that when people are searching, they actually can find it and when they find it, when it comes up in the list, what they see actually makes sense. Ginger, did you um, have a comment? It flashed me a little bit. Okay, so let's talk about the blurb real quick. Um, when you're putting together a blurb, um, one of the things that always gets me, um, we work with a lot of um, fiction, particularly fiction um, publishers and authors, and one of the things we tend to find is the classic blurb that was written for kind of the back of the book when you had all the rest of the book cover and the flaps and the inside of the book to do other parts of the cell. That, that classic back as the online main face of your book isn't necessarily 
cut it the way that we historically did them. So this is a, a kind of four step, you know, how do you build your blurb? Uh, we think you should always have kind of this very short, punchy above, above the fold tagline, a little bit reflective of your elevator pitch. You know, the thing that says, this is what this book is and who it's for, okay? Um, I like to see a very uh, present tense synopsis, right? That uses active verbs, okay? Um, and particularly if it's fiction, okay, it demonstrates, you know, the best part of the plot, okay? Um, one of the things that we see missing a lot from the book blurbs is the selling paragraph, right? The thing that says, okay, now I've hooked you, you're interested in my plot, what's the kind of emotional sell for why you should buy this book? Um, you know, I was always, when I was, I still do a little bit, but when I was younger, I was very into fast cars and stick shifts and, you know, big engines and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, the sales guys were always great. They knew, you know, how to get me, right? When we were at sell time, right? How to, how to get that emotional appeal and identification to me. Uh, and your book blurb needs that. And lastly, uh, particularly if this is on your website, uh, one of the things we see missing a lot is the call to action that asks the readers to buy, you know, with the buttons to get there. Um, you know, you should never forget that. I know sometimes authors and publishers think, oh, I really want to be completely selling, you know, my work's creative, it's art, you know, it should kind of sell itself. But like with any product, no matter how good it is, no matter how expensive, no matter how much value, you do have to sell it. So we think that's really important. So again, it's kind of a set before we kind of get into the thing. The, the kind of prep stuff you want to do starting is to make sure you really have a good understanding of your audience and you've tested that. You've understood a little bit about how they talk, how they think, how they're going to search for stuff like yours. And then you want to write the selling copy, the marketing copy, okay, the, the, the elevator pitch, the blurb, and the search copy that are going to do it. And, and that content will be the thing that gets you into, you know, how do you start getting your website, your social channels, your posting on, you know, in the online stores, all up to the point where you'll have things that will sell and convert. Make sense, everybody? All right, so now we're gonna get a little technical. Um, a lot of the people we work with, a lot of, you know, over 50% of the, um, the websites today um, are done on WordPress. So I always like to start there. And one of the things, you know, as we know, this is a tough world, a lot of bad actors out there, lots of stuff happening to just about everybody. Um, so the question is, you know, if you're using WordPress, it's great, really easy. You can do a lot of stuff with it. There's a lot of people, a lot of developers out there know how to work with it. But the question is, are you doing it dumb? And what I mean by that is, you know, do you have your WordPress site set up so it's safe, secure, up to date, and going to work in a way that it's not going to kind of be in your way? So for instance, um, you know, are you going in regularly and updating to the latest WordPress core. You know, WordPress does releases on average about once every six to eight weeks. Um, are all your themes, any themes you're using up to date? Um, are all your plugins up to date? If you have themes and plugins you're not using, have you gotten rid of them? Um, the other question is, do you have plugins and themes that you get from trusted sources? You know, uh, WordPress.org actually puts plugins online, sets them up, you know, so, so is that where you're getting from? If you got them from someplace else, do you know where? Um, if you have any that are unused, if you have any that are unused, okay, um, do you have you take them, you know, you want to take them out of your site and set them up. Now, the real key is to kind of keep the environment, your WordPress environment, very clean and very up to date. Because if you don't, that's the kind of thing that'll, that'll play. On average, on each WordPress update, core update, there's probably 10 to 15 security updates. So it's really important to kind of keep it up to date. The other piece, you know, obviously, you know, you would think this would be pretty obvious, but you'd be surprised how many people we work with where they don't have it, is are you backing up your site? Are you doing that regularly? You know, regularly, we actually do daily backups for all our sites once a day. So for all our sites, all our customer sites, we do them daily. Um, and if you are doing backups, most people say, yeah, I'm doing them, but I'm doing them once a week or I do them once a month. I don't update that often. You know, the frequency of your backups is up to you. If, you know, you lose stuff, you'll lose whatever updates you've done in the middle. But you also want to make sure if you are doing backups, have you actually tested the restore? Do you actually know that your backups are working and that you can restore? So if you haven't done that, you need to go check that. Um, are you using strong passwords? Um, or do you use the same password everywhere? And is it, you know, your your name and your birthday or your name and your dog's birthday or something else that people are going to figure out. 
I know you've heard a lot about kind of password hacks and things like that. One of the challenges is if you use a very common password and you've been in Yahoo or one of these things that have been hacked, then that password is out there. So even though you may have gotten rid of your Yahoo mail account or something else, if you're using, still using that same password everywhere else, it can come in. So we believe you should be using strong passwords. There's, I'm going to talk about it in a minute. There's good password managers that will generate them automatically. Um, and if other people have access to your WordPress site, you want to make sure that you force everyone to use a strong password when you do it. A um, couple of other cleanups. Um, when WordPress installs, there's a default user called admin. You want to make sure you're deleting that. You also want to limit login attempts. Okay, there's plugins that do that. Um, most good um, hosts will have it set up to do that. So, you know, if someone tries to log in more than three times, they get locked and you as the admin have to unlock them. Um, and then, you know, are you using a secure host and do they know WordPress? There's lots of hosting companies out of there, lots of places you can put WordPress. Um, we recommend using a dedicated WordPress host. There's a number of them out there. Uh, we happen to use WordPress Engine, which is down in Austin, but there's a number of good ones out there. Um, because what you want is somebody that really knows WordPress so that when you're having a problem, they can fix it for you. So when you call their support line, you're saying, hey, this is happening, they can really give you the support. So that's an important thing. So that's kind of, you know, some, some kind of core cheat sheet things to look at if you're using WordPress. Couple of other things. Um, no matter whether you're using WordPress or anything else, uh, I call this, are you practicing safe site? Um, do you have your site protected? The key to looking at that is, are you using SSL for your site? Now, a couple of years ago, SSL, that's, that's, you know, when you have the little green bar at the top and it's protected, um, and instead of HTTP, it's HTTPS. Um, a couple of years ago, the only sites that used that were kind of e-commerce sites and banking sites. Now, Google is using that to actually affect your ranking. So regardless of what site it is, it's up. So you have visitors coming to your site, Particularly if you're asking them to sign up for your newsletter or to create an account or anything else, you want to make sure you're protecting their privacy. So you need to understand what SSL is, that's the secure socket layer, what the HTTPS protocol is, that's the version of HTTP that, that uses SSL. Uh, there's actually a new version, HTTP2, that's coming out. You need to understand what those are and what they do. Um, SSL is not just for e-commerce sites anymore. Okay, besides privacy and security, it also will impact your site ranking. Google is taking into, into that in effect. Um, if you don't have a certificate yet, there's lots of options. Your, host, your, your hosting company probably has options. Um, Let's Encrypt is an open source company that does free certificates today. Um, they're good for 90 days. Um, hosting companies like, like WordPress Engine actually use Let's Encrypt and they automatically renew them every 90 days for you. So there's lots of sources. So I would go do that. Um, if you do have a cert, make sure you test it. Um, I get the link here in this, and we'll, we'll provide the, the deck afterwards, but uh, it's www.ssllabs.com, SSL test, and it'll actually test your certificate, because believe it or not, many, many SSL certificates that are being used out there have now have security holes that are coming up, so you want to kind of keep up with them and go do it. So you want to make sure that not only are you doing the things with whatever your content management system like WordPress is right, but regardless of what, what site you're using, that you really do have it um, um, plugged up. Hold on a minute, Ginger. I'll look at the chat here for a minute. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Ginger. I appreciate that. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Um, besides having SSL, the other thing that we recommend is do you have a bolt lock on your site? So in your house, you probably have two locks, right? You have the lock on the door and you have the bolt lock, right? Well, your website needs the same thing. And the bolt lock analogy is what we call two-factor authentication. And you probably use this if you use Google Apps or use something else, you probably signed up for this. And what that means is besides having the password to sign into your account, you set it up so that you have to have another device, usually your phone or something else, that will actually go do that. Lots of ways to do two-factor authentication. If you're using WordPress, lots of ways to seamlessly integrate it. Um, Google Authenticator is really good. Uh, we use du Duo a lot. Um, it's pretty good. Um, Clef is around, although they're having some issues right now, so I probably wouldn't recommend them anymore. Uh, and Authy is also pretty good. Um, but we would definitely recommend on your email and social accounts that you have two-factor authentication set up and you have it set up for your website so that you know, when, you, when you're trying to log in, you basically get that. And that, that can keep you from getting hacked. We, all, we know that's what's up. So important to both practice safe site 
and, and make sure you have the, the correct kind of bolt lock on your site, bolt lock on your site. So those are kind of the security things your site. Um, the next part kind of deals with indexing. And believe it or not, the first question I ask is, um, is your site indexed? And you would be absolutely amazed at the number of authors and publishers when we first work with them, where we find that their site's not getting indexed because they've set the site up that says, don't index me yet. And they forgot to turn that off or someone forgot to turn it off. So how do you check that? Um, if you go to Google and just in the browser bar, type in your site name, colon, parentheses, and then whatever your site name is, in my case, it would be like publisher.cloud, and parentheses. That will actually give you a listing of all the pages on your site, okay, that are, are indexed, and it will indicate which ones are ranking, okay? So you can review which ones are ranking. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna be at the top of the ranking for your generic keywords, but it does mean that Google is actually indexing your pages and they're starting to rank your page. So like if you look at the, the thing on the right side here, you can see our homepage for publisher.cloud is getting indexed um, and the privacy policy is getting indexed, our news and updates is getting indexed, our features page is getting indexed, our news and research, okay? And then we had a, um, a post that was a pretty important post where we had changed our brand and that was getting indexed. So that's what you wanna test for is, are your pages actually getting indexed when they come up? Okay, so why do you care about that? Well, one, if your site's blocked, you're never gonna rank in Google. You also wanna look to see if the number of pages you expected to be indexed are. So for instance, if you have e-commerce functionality within your website, you don't want the login and account pages and stuff like that to be indexed, okay? Um, but you do wanna make sure that all the pages you expected, all the public pages, all your blog posts are actually getting indexed. And you wanna make sure that if there's pages there that you don't want to be indexed, okay, that you take them out. And if there's pages that are missing that you want ranked, that you put them in. Things to check, um, robots.txt is a, is a file um, for your website, okay? Your host can tell you about this. Um, and that's where the blocking status is set. So you wanna make sure that's shut off, all right? Um, if you're an author publisher, you wanna check your sections, you know, books, blog, store, you know, make sure that those are set up. Um, if you have subdomains, so you know a subdomain would be like in front of your thing, you have uh, like store.publisher.cloud or um, maybe it's something else. So if you have any subdomains you're using, you wanna see if those are coming up. Um, you do wanna look to see if there are spam pages. So one of the things that happens when sites get hacked and sometimes you don't even know is these spammers will put pages into your site and they'll start getting indexed and drive traffic back to them based on your search juice. So you wanna to try to find those and go correct them. Um, so it's important, again, if you're gonna you know, figure out, you know, use Google and use search, you, there's some technical stuff you gotta make sure that to make sure it's cleaned up and you're really kind of doing that stuff. Next one, so besides once you're getting indexed, the next question is, are you giving Google a map? Okay, and the way you do that is something called a site map. Okay, if you're using WordPress, uh, the WordPress SEO things like Yoast will automatically generate them. There's also plug plugins that'll generate them. There's also tools for a regular website where you can generate a sitemap and XML. And then you take that sitemap and you go into Google Webmaster and into Big Web, Bing Webmaster and you submit the sitemap. And what that says is, hey Google, my site is here and here's the pages I want you to index. And that's gonna be your pages, your images, all your content. So you wanna get the sitemap generated if you don't know how, if your web developer's doing it for you, make sure they've generated um, a good sitemap. If your site content changes a lot, if you're doing a lot of posting to your site and dynamic, you wanna update your sitemap, you know, probably every month, every six, eight weeks, and then resubmit it to make sure that those pages are getting picked up as well. Um, and then you can go into Google Webmaster and actually see, you know, which things have been submitted and which things are getting indexed. And even if you do it well, like you can see here, um, this was a site that we did and you know, it was a small site. We knew how to do it pretty well. There were 57 pages. Um, and over the course of about a month, we had picked up about 40 of them. So we picked up a pretty significant percentage of them. Uh, we submitted a lot of images. Those weren't getting indexed yet. So we were gonna go work on those. But you do wanna try to drive this because again, the results in Google are gonna be driven by, you know, is it finding and you know, kind of are you in the index? If you're not in the table of contents, then you're never gonna rank. So it's an important technical element to get right. Okay, so some of the problems that we see is people don't create their sitemaps. 
Um, they don't include it in the robots.txt file so that when the engine finds it, it can say, here's my latest site map. Um, we see a lot of times where the people have created multiple versions and they don't delete the old ones. You, you got to do that. You got to get rid of them. Um, and they don't go back to the search consoles and keep them current. Um, and particularly if you have large sites, um, you know, some, some publishers have very large catalogs and stuff. Um, sitemaps have a thing called indexes so that Google can kind of figure that out because Google has a budget that it uses. So you don't want to do that, right? So the actions to take with your map is to make sure you're not causing the problems. Um, check the number of URLs submitted and indexed. You want to monitor indexation. Um, and again, Google does have a budget, so you need to check, like, are, is your site really getting indexed when you kind of go through it? Um, next kind of concept to this, uh, also a little technical, I know, but I think it's important to kind of understand, you know, what you're trying to do is, is tell Google you're there, get them to index you, okay, and then, you know, get them to have you show up in search racing, right? So part of what we're looking at is, is your crawled versus indexed ratio out of, out of, rack, uh, of whack. So, you know, you have how many of your pages are getting crawled, which ones are getting indexed, okay? And based on that, which ones are getting ranked? And why might that be out of, out of whack? So we'll kind of talk through that here in a minute. So the reason you care about this is Google has you on a crawl budget. In other words, when they look at your site, depending on how much authority you have, how big you are, how long your site's been around, they're only gonna crawl so much of you. Um, if you have duplicate pages, if you have multiple pages that have relatively the same kind of content, Google's going to kind of downgrade that, okay? So it really can dil dilute your competitive strength. So you want to look for that. So you want to look for duplicate page content. One of the places we see that in publishing a lot is the hardback, paperback, ebook pages all basically have the same content. The only thing that's really different is the format and the price. Um, but from Google's perspective, those are different pages, but duplicate content. The other mistake we see people make is between the www version of the page and the non www. So you got to tell Google which one you use. Either one's good, but you got to tell them which one you use and make sure that all the juice goes to one rather than getting split between them. Uh, the other place people mess up is if they're moving to HTTPS, making it secure. Um, those again are considered different pages. So you got to tell Google is HTTPS my preferred or HTTP my preferred, which one do I do? Um, one of the other things we see in publisher sites a lot uh, that can be issues are um, books go out of print or we don't want to have rights to them or something else happens and we remove those pages. And when you do that, when you remove it or you update a page or change the name of a page, you have to make sure you redirect that URL because Google already indexed it and it's going to come back and try to find it. And if it starts finding missing pages, it'll start to downgrade your site in terms of rankings. So you really want to make sure you're kind of keeping up with that to kind of keep up with Google and make sure it's really kind of checking your site. So we've kind of talked through um, some kind of technical stuff now about, you know, making sure you're, you're getting your site indexed. If you are getting an index, making sure you don't have to do content. Um, the other piece, this is again, particularly, you know, relevant to, to authors and publishers, you know, telling your story and telling your book story, but it really applies to any business. So, you know, one of the things that we look at is the about page you have as an author, are you using the same blurb there that you have everywhere else? Um, if you do that, you know, one, it's probably not very interesting because your big author blurb that you push everywhere else is probably not all that great. Uh, but also, you know, your website is a place where you get to tell people really about you and who you are. And it's a place that you own and you can make it distinct. So this is a place to really do that, you know. And if you're a writer, part of what we think is really important is to really give fans and readers the context and timeline, okay, of your writing, of what's going on, right? Um, you know, is the stuff about you and about your books, you know, engaging and fresh? You know, are you using images, visuals? Um, is it current? You know, is the bio you have four years old? Because you know, then I'll think, you know, do I think you're dead? You're not writing anymore? Or what are you doing? So are you keeping it up to date? Um, one of the things that we like to see, even on an author site where you have a, one book or a small number of books, is that each book has its own page. Um, one of the things that's very popular right now is one-page websites. I don't think those are necessarily wrong for authors. But even there, when you build one-page websites, the subsections tend to be their own pages. So we think each book should have its own page, all right? And then on that page, you don't want to just do the standard blurb. You want to try to put some additional content 
uh, maybe imagery, uh, question and answer stuff. Um, you know, the real question is, you know, particularly for your website, are you answering the questions people have? Are you giving them something special when they visit you? You know, why are you different than what they would see on Amazon browsing the store? Um, and then the last piece is, do you make it easy to buy? Even if you don't sell the books yourself, if you only sell them through your publisher, through, through retailers, um, do you have links to every place they can buy their book? Uh, and there's actually, like in WordPress, there's some pretty good plugins that help you do that, uh, or you can do it yourself. Uh, but you do want to make it very easy if people have found your book and they decide they want to buy it to get to where they want to buy it. Uh, obviously, favoring whichever your preferred channels are, like if you sell them yourself or your publisher sells them and you get a better deal, that's fine. But, you know, ultimately, if people buy your book and read it, that's good. So you want to try to encourage that stuff. Next slide. I don't know if anybody um, um, watched uh, The Young Pope on HBO uh, this past year. It was kind of an interesting show. My wife and I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, but in, in websites is a thing called canonical law, uh, not the religious kind. Um, and what canonical about is when you have this duplicate content, this is how you tell Google, hey, this content is really here. So one of the clear places in publishing that we like to see that, and if you look at like in our publisher.cloud platform, we do this is we generate pages for what we call the main edition of a book and then for every other edition. So let's say, for instance, the publisher had ebook, paperback, hardback, and their ebook was the main edition. That was the one they sold mainly online. What we do with the paperback and the hardback is on their pages, we make the canonical, so we point it back to the main. So we tell Google, hey, that main page is the main page. This is not duplicate content, so that any hits on those pages all index back to the same thing and drive that, right? And it really helps you when you get the site, so you don't get like the same basic page indexed over and over again. You know, the same content indexed over and over again. It lets you structure the site the way you need and not mess up cert. Um, most CMSs let you do this, okay, or you can add it in, uh, and it's a, it's a little thing to go do it. Um, one of the tools we use to do this, to kind of check for this, is a tool called Screaming Frog, which will go through your website and actually index um, all your URLs and determine where you have them. Um, Canonical isn't for pagination. If you have a big catalog where you have a lot of pagination, um, there's actually another rel called Previous Next, and you want to try to use that for paging, like in a category for, through book pages. Um, but again, this is, you know, this is kind of the, the technical stuff of SEO. But again, you or your web developer should be doing this stuff. Um, if you're not, then, then there's no way you can compete with the bigger guys while, they're, while you're doing this stuff. Um, another one up is um, writing a title that Google and readers will love. Um, really surprisingly, um, a lot of people, their page names, okay, the thing that shows up in the, in the header of the browser, okay, um, doesn't show up well. Um, so what do you want to do? Your page name, you want to rank for the keyword, but you also want, since that's what's going to come up in search, you want and users see that, you want them to see that to click through the page. Um, so it's not necessarily the heading on the page, right? This is the page title that's going to show up in search. You want to make it clear, descriptive. It should be as unique as possible, all right? Almost, if you can include your brand, I would almost make that a rule, okay? If you notice, like in mine, publisher.cloud always comes up first. So it can come up first or last, but always do that. Um, there are kind of three modes when you see a title in Google. So kind of wide, narrow, mobile. Uh, and you want to optimize so that it works in all of those, right? The good news is this is something you can optimize after you publish. So even once your website is up, if you're looking in search and you see that the, the, the names of the pages that are getting indexed are kind of messed up, you can fix that stuff. The other piece, you know, we kind of talked about the title, but the other piece is the description. That's the thing that comes up under the link. Um, and, you know, do your meta descriptions click and are you setting here this is where that search description when we talked about your book or for you as an author is really important and for many people what gets picked up here is just you know the book broad text or whatever was on the page a lot of times it's gobbledygook because like if you're using wordpress or something the plugins will put other stuff so you really need to make sure you overtly set this and you make it clear enough and long enough that when someone looks at it they actually get it, right? That says, this is what it is, this is why, what am I trying to do, um, where do I go in? Um, so for instance, if you look down here and look at this author and look at the, the fifth entry, translations, 
um, the very first thing she has is skip to content, home, books list. That's like a menu. So Poppy has some translations of works. What she should be saying here is, hey, my works are available in French, German, Italian. If you want to get them, go here. So you really want to try to make sure that this stuff is up to date and not just kind of generic stuff that's getting picked up from your CMS or somewhere else. So if you want Google to work, you know, you got to invest the time to really make that, make that live and make it work. So a little bit, we, this, we kind of said most of this, but you know, fix the gobbledygook stuff. Um, 135 to 160 is about what will show. Sometimes the engines will show more, so you don't have to be up. Um, you do want to make this inviting. The whole idea is this is the doorman, not the bouncer, right? You want someone when they read it to come into your site. Um, you want to make it legible, readable, use your keywords, obviously. Um, one of the ways I like to say this is treat this like an ad for your web page. So when someone searches for something and your pages come up, the title and that description are the thing that potentially is going to get them to punch through. So you really want to think about that as kind of sales copy, right? Um, Definitely no duplicates, so you don't want to use the same description over and over again on pages, okay? That'll, definitely, that'll show up bad and users won't click through. Um, the other piece is there are things called rich snippets. So you know when you're in Google and you see things like, hey, you know, this is a book or if it's a review where you have the review stars. Um, rich snippets are things you can add to your HTML code so that when Google picks it up, it knows how. I'm going to talk a little bit more about structured data in a minute. But it knows how it knows what that thing is, and so it'll help format up what shows up in the search results. So you can actually Im impact them. Reviews is probably the biggest one by making the review star show up, where you can influence what Google does. Um, another one: Are you identifying the titles and chapters in your website? Again, this will apply a little bit to people in publishing, but for for almost all businesses, it's still the same. The your website pages, okay need kind of titles and chapters just like a book does. The way you do that is which what's called header tags, the H tags, H1, H2, H3. Unfortunately, a lot of people have gotten to where they use these for formatting. Uh, so you'll see that, you know, because I can make them a certain size and make them bold and everything, but it really does screw it up. So the goal of the H1 is there should only be one H1 per page, and that should tell Google, this is what this page is about. The H2s break out the content sections. So what the H2s do is say, here are the major content sections on the site. So if it was your author page, it might be your bio, it might be your gallery, it might be your calendar, it might be your blog post. So H2s can be used in, 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 in the, lower, the lower headings to kind of break that up. And Google will work that. So it really is a way to kind of map your content for the engines, and it does help users as well. Again, only one H1. Okay, and in that H1, you should have keywords that reflect the content, and then use the H2s and below to really structure the rest of what you're doing. So that'll help from search perspective, and it'll also help users. Okay, third piece is, are you making Google guess? Okay, um, so we talked a little bit about the rich snippets above. Um, if you're doing books, or you're offering a service, or you're offering a product for sale, what you need to tell Google is that's what this is, because then Google, instead of representing this as just another piece of web content, can actually treat it. So you know when you go into Google and you see the book cover come up on the right side? That's because on, on that page that got indexed, the web people told Google, this is a book. It has an author. It has a price. Okay, Here is its release date. Here's where it's up. And there's a whole set of structured data. Um, it's, uh, it, it's done by a, an organization called schema.org. And there's different types of structured data for different sites. Um, in publishing, you know, books, authors, products are all ones to up. And there's tools. Google has a structured data testing tool that will actually do that. So you need to use this to tell Google the content of your page is a book, whatever else it is, and the other stuff it wants to know. So if it's a book, it wants to know title, author, ISBN. Uh, if you're selling it, you need to give them the price and the details. Um, this is where you do rich snippets, OK? Um, and there's tools to, and plugins that help you do this stuff. So again, if you do search.google.com structured data, uh, that, there's some good explanation out there, and there's a good structured testing tool that will tell you that that's there. That's an important one to kind of go look at. And it's, it's probably the biggest failure we see in a lot of author sites is they don't do this. And it's one of the reasons they'll never rank up for themselves or for their books 
is because you know you have the online bookstores and, and other places that sell that are doing this stuff and basically outgunning you. So even though your content is better, even though you own the, the domain and the name and the keywords, this kind of stuff is important to do. Okay, um, Ginger, about seven, I think we're timing good. Um, next piece is we've kind of talked about structures. Um, the other piece is, you know, is your site fresh, exciting, and inviting? Um, you know, websites are, are kind of like vegetables or like fruit, okay? Would you rather eat the strawberries on the left or the strawberries on the right? Um, so the key of that is, you know, does your website look like 2017 or does it look like 2007? Remember, most people today are looking for your website, probably on a mobile device, okay? Um, one of the tests that we asked people to do was when was the last time you updated anything on your website? You know, and you'd be surprised at the number of times we hear 2014. Um, when was the last time you have updated your website? When was the last time you updated your homepage? Uh, one of the tests that I like to do for people is to tell them to cut their homepage in quadrants and look at each quadrant and try to understand how often each one of those quadrants has changed. Um, are you also, are you using kind of standard boilerplate for your bio and book descriptions or distribute everywhere? Or do you have unique content? Um, do you add fresh content out about your book, whether it's a new review, um, if there's things going on in the news in your life that relate to the book, are you doing kind of a reflection back? Um, if any of you are Games of Thrones fans, you know the new season's coming up in another month or so. We're all waiting to kind of see that. But you can, you know, over the last six months, right, they've been kind of building cadence for that, right? Coming back, reflecting old seasons, old parts of the story. There's lots of ways you can do that, right? Um, and kind of most importantly today, does your site look good on small screens and big screens? Does it scale seamlessly and nicely, right? So does it look good in a mobile device? And does it look good in the TV? You know, TVs are going to become increasingly important places where people will absorb web content. So you need to not just think about like the desktop or even the desktop on the phone. You really need to think across devices. Another piece to kind of look at, um, are you using two color gradients? Okay, um, those have changed a little bit, a lot of things going on. Um, you know, using video with sound, you know, I, and set up, that's an important thing. Uh, we're gonna see um, virtual reality more and more that's starting to come up and become, you know, more um, approachable now so you can incorporate into your site. Uh, if you've seen any parallax sites, that's where you slide the site, the images kind of slide up, you know, while you're looking at stuff, you're gonna see more and more of that. Um, we are seeing a move to kind of super simple home pages where you have kind of one large image limited. So when people land, whether it's on a phone or whatever, they kind of get that. And then the navigation kind of takes them into the story. Um, one of the things I've noticed over the last six, nine months is neutral color pads are back in. So I think that'll be the big thing for 2017 going into 18. You know, next year it could be bright color palettes, that changes. So you, you do want to kind of stay with the style, but still reflect your own brand. Um, custom to topography has become really important. You're going to see more and more of that. Uh, so lots of people are doing this now where they're not just using, you know, kind of standard web fonts to do it, but they are using custom topography to make their website really stand out and make it a good experience. Another piece is, are you, uh, do you do visual? Uh, there's lots of great tools out there to do it. Um, we use a tool called Canva. There's others. Um, uh, the buffer people have one called Pablo. Um, but the, you know, you want to use tools that let you create good stuff. Uh, make sure you have rights to all the visuals you do. Um, you know, the good news is there's still a lot of good stock solutions out there and there's a, a lot of good common commons license stuff. Uh, but with your phone today, you know, you can take images about just about anything. So you really can, even if you're not, you know, the most artistic person in the world, I'm not, uh, you really can add um, a lot more stuff in. So it's important to think visual. Um, when, if you kind of look at the FAPA site, we do the Florida Authors and Publishers Association site and work it. Uh, one of the things we tried to do there was to do a lot of visual. So uh, every blog post we do, we try to have a visual header um, and we try to have a picture of the member, whether it's an author or a publisher of the book, whatever event we're doing and try to share that. Uh, our folks were just up at uh, Book Expo. We had a, a big crew up at Book Expo for who were um, um, selling books from our, our members. Um, and they did a lot of video and we posted that on our Facebook channel and other places. So important to do visual and to have a nice, you know, get a set of tools to do that. 
Um, I do recommend you to try to do original photos, okay? Um, because it's pretty easy, you know you're legal. Uh, you can use stock images that Pixabay, Unsplash offer free Creative Commons and uh, the premium sites like iStock and Shutterstock obviously do them uh, fairly cost effectively. Uh, GIFs are becoming increasingly important. Uh, Giphy has a uh, huge selection of existing and has an app for creating your own. Uh, there's also alternatives for that, so that's a skill you want to play with a little bit. Uh, and then we talked about the design tools like Canva, Pablo Stencil, PicMonkey. Uh, there's lots of ways. So the basic message I think is find a set of tools you're comfortable with, uh, but always think about generating visual content. Text is not enough. You want to have it and, and have it work for you. Um, another piece that we think we see people miss a lot um, are you using keywords in your file names. So when you name the files, one of the things we get a lot is uh, from publishers is a lot of times we get like the ISBN number, which doesn't mean anything to a human or a search engine usually, right? Um, the, or we've got some other internal scheme or gobby look from the camera. Um, what I like to recommend is come up with a keyword scheme and a structure for your file names, for your pictures, and make sure you use that. When you post your pictures to the website, they always should have alt tags. Google will never know what your images are if you don't tell it. Um, use captions where appropriate. People read them. Okay, um, and then use the right file type. Um, JPEG, PNG, GIF are kind of the popular ones. We're gonna start seeing um, some more. Google just announced kind of a new format that we think is gonna come up. But for different uses, each use is important. So it's important to get to, get to understand them, and understand which ones are up. Uh, one of the mistakes we see people make a lot is not sizing images appropriately. So if you're only gonna use an image small, even though your content management system will you know, shrink it down for you, that's not gonna do well in terms of page speed because the image is still that big when it tries to download. So, so make sure you size things appropriately to the use you're doing and make sure you're optimizing your images, okay? Um, you don't have to have everything at 300 DPI. You wanna have a good high resolution image that works with retina displays, but you also can optimize them to do it. And we talked earlier, if you have a large site, image site maps are important in order to get the images indexed. Um, Another piece up uh, is, are you cross-linking everything, all right? Um, so for instance, on your website, you have clear links to where people can buy your books, okay? Um, you know, and if, you're, if your publisher's positioning, can you go back and forth, right? Um, do your, your social channels point back to your website and point back to where your people can buy your books? Does your Amazon author page and Goodreads author page point back to your site, right? Um, does your author profile, okay? Point, you know, if you have it on multiple sites, you know, point back to your website and social channels, right? Um, if you have a fan group, is that obvious on your social site? So it's really important as you build kind of your social channels out that you link everything together. And what we like to talk about is a model where your website is your home base, your social channels are kind of your outpost, you know, communities where you set things up, and then search, email, mobile, you know, are all kind of on ramps that bring traffic to you. So you should try to set those up. Um, do you have broken links? Uh, this is one people don't check for a lot, particularly in blog posts and things like that, uh, where links break. If you have links to Amazon, Amazon has a habit of changing book links every once in a while, so you need to check for those. So what we recommend there is generally doing a regular site scan to find them and adding redirects. Um, if you know that you've changed, that links have changed, um, you can look for 404s. 404s is where you have a missing page when you look at at um, Google Analytics and at Webmaster Tools, and you can do a redirect from there. So that's kind of website. We kind of talked through that. Uh, we're a little after seven, so we're gonna move forward now uh, onto social. Ginger, do we wanna take a break and just see if anybody's got any questions? I know it's been kind of a lot of information, but um, we can check for that. Uh, there are tools to check for broken links. Um, it, it really depends on kind of where you do that, you know, whether you're using, um, um, WordPress or which content management system you're using or your website. Um, but the, uh, the one I talked about earlier, Screaming Frog, will scan your whole site and it'll look for links and check for them being lost. Yes, if anybody has any questions, just type them into the chat window and we'll be happy to answer them. I'm sure John would not mind taking a moment now to answer any questions that, of any of the content he's gone over so, thus far. Yeah, the only question I saw is the one that you've already answered, John, and that was, 
in regards to the tool for broken links. Okay. Again, I know it's a lot, so I don't get overwhelmed by it. We'll, we'll make the material available so you can see it. Um, but I think the real thing to check about is, like anything, and this is it's kind of like working out, right? There's a there's a set of steps to go through here. They're not overtly complicated. You just got to kind of set up a structure for yourself and work through first your website, then your social channels in each one, and then make sure you're doing kind of the recurring checks to kind of keep it up to date. And as long as you have your objectives really clearly defined, it's pretty easy to do once you have the process set up. So let's move forward to a little bit uh, on socials. Um, one of the questions we get asked a lot is, which social channel should I be on? Do I have to be on all of them? Where go up? I, I, my general recommendation is always, you know, you need to pick the social channel where your audience is most likely to be. And you need to pick the social channels that you're actually going to have the time and interest and effort in to actually invest in, to participate in, and keep updated. So I do think it's important to kind of grab the real estate. So on any major social network, you should try to grab your brand or grab your name so you're there and at least, you know, get set up so you're there, okay? But, you know, if you're really not going to use the social channel, you can always use it to just point it back to your website or one of your other social channels, right? So if you're not a big Twitter thing, have a minor Twitter thing, post once a month to maybe post a news item and keep, you know, keep them coming back, but at least you own it. So if you ever need it, you can go get to it. Um, what I like to kind of talk about it for, for any um, social channel is a kind of social C note. You know, if you're going to do a social channel, do you have at least 100 followers, right? And, and building the plan to get that first 100 and, and then engaging them and seeing them. So follower accounts per se aren't a thing, but particularly like on a Facebook page, um, you know, it does have an influence. If people follow your page and like your page, uh, you're going to show up in the news stream and share it. So it is an important piece um, to go get it. Um, so this is going to be oriented to the page, but it really applies to any of the social things. Make sure you fill out the whole thing, okay? Make sure your whole profile for your page is filled out, uh, that you care. If it's one where you have a community and you're going to be there, you want to post regularly, um, we think three or four times a week is a minimum. We think once a day is better uh, that you show up. Um, one of the things that we like to see a lot when people bring up a page or if they have a page that really hasn't had a lot of stuff is you do usually have a pretty big personal network. So using your personal profile on Facebook or on, you know, using like your personal Twitter account to get people um, to interact and share your page is good. Now, you don't want to kind of slam all your friends and everybody, right? But if you know it's people who've liked your books and stuff, that's a good thing to do. Uh, we do think that for Facebook, a small targeted ad, you can spend about 50 bucks or so to kind of get up to your kind of the social C-note to the, the 100. Um, Facebook Live is really good. Um, it gets ranked a lot now, so it's an important thing to go in. Uh, and you can, you know, mo you should monitor the activity, be responsive. Um, on your Facebook page, you should enable Messenger. So you should be using that personally, enable Messenger. That way people who want to communicate to you through your page can get to you real time. I think that's an important thing. Um, and, you know, we think, again, if you're an author or in publishing, uh, a Facebook page is a really good way to engage people in your writing process, your publishing process, your marketing process, right? So you can share things all through the process while you're writing the book, while you're getting it published, while you're marketing it, post, you know, you can keep them engaged by doing that stuff. Um, we talked about images before. One of the things to really make sure you're aware of is what size images work on which social networks. And if you're posting or cross-posting, make sure that the, you're posting the right size image for that network. Uh, it really can make your post pretty useless if you don't do that. Um, you also want to look at, particularly if you're using Facebook or, you know, the other ad-oriented social networks, um, you know, are you really looking at your audience? So Facebook has some really good tools within their advertising side for kind of audience optimization, really understanding, you know, kind of what interests they have and how to target down what you're doing. So you, you want to make sure, again, if you're building a page that you're doing some of that. Um, you know, look at what interests they have, age, gender, language, location. Um, the cool part is you can even target this at a post level um, and you can restrict to see stuff. So if you want to do kind of early release stuff for your beta readers or let's say you have both kids and adults, but you have some stuff that is not appropriate for the kids or you have some stuff for the kids that the adults really wouldn't be interested in, you can restrict when you post like which stuff is going to show up. So you, you can make the news feeds of these networks work for you. Um, one of the questions we get asked a lot is uh, when do I post to social networks, particularly to Facebook? 
Um, this is a chart that came out, uh, I think it's about six months old now, uh, but it is really reflective. You know, a lot of people think, hey, between five and seven is a really good time or whatever else. Uh, it turns out if you look that late at night is really a great time to post. And the reason is if you're posting at those, the kind of five to seven windows, um, that at that point in time, you're competing with everybody else. So your chances of getting in the news streams of the people you want are much lower. And you know, most people when they do their news stream, they're gonna go, kind of go back and they're gonna look through kind of the last 24 hours. So if you've posted at night and you get into the news stream, then you're much more likely they'll see you the next day. So we actually think it's better to actually be posting kind of, you know, midday and then at nighttime, uh, you know, we kind of call it the Facebook lifestyle thing, right? Um, because remember, again, your posts are being shown to a subset of users who like to follow your page. Um, and you know, it depends on kind of your organic reach, right? And the amount of engagement you have and so the amount that people share stuff. Um, so the intuitive thing of time isn't, you know, uh, the most obvious thing. So nine to 11, you know, turns out to be better. Um, best day of the week uh, also, um, believe it or not, when you go look, uh, weekends turn out to be stronger than during the week. Um, so again, you're not competing with kind of the big commercial brands because they tend not to be as active then. So that's something to think about. Uh, and the other piece is, you know, on Facebook is, are you mixing it up like a DJ? There's multiple kinds of posts and content that you can do on a Facebook page. Questions, image posts, videos, links, giveaways, coupons, discounts. Um, and the interactions, you know, will vary based on that. So you want to kind of mix it up. Uh, Videos get the highest shares like you'd think. Um, questions combined with images of videos actually drive the most interaction. Um, text only with questions are not so good. And giveaways give the most comments. So again, you wanna think about your mix. Uh, so you build an engagement strategy on your, on your social network, particularly on Facebook, that works. Um, one of the pieces of advice we do for people a lot now is not to post uh, YouTube videos to Facebook. Uh, Facebook is pushing its own video structure. So if you create a video, post it to your YouTube channel, but also post it to Facebook. So if you use YouTube videos on Facebook, they're not gonna rank on Facebook. They're not gonna get into the news streams. Um, and you do wanna keep your Facebook photos and videos organized. You wouldn't believe how many um, publishers and authors I go in, and this is just a mess. And so when users come in, they have no way to find them. So you wanna get them organized in albums that make sense. Uh, and so if people are coming in and seeing your page, they can find things. If they're looking to share something, they can find the pictures pretty easily. So, you know, make sure you kind of keep them cleaned up and, and set up. Um, if you haven't done Facebook Live yet, I would recommend it. Uh, it's a very good engagement vehicle. I would probably try it out personally first before you try it out in your page. Um, but it is a great way to promote a new or forthcoming book by reading a chapter to your followers. Uh, it's also a great way to kind of give behind the scenes access to where you write. Uh, sources of inspiration, you know, if that's a location or a person or something else. Um, it can be from your workspace. Fans love that. Um, <clears throat> if you're having events, uh, doing a broadcast from the event, if you're doing a book signing, yeah, that's great. Um, if you're kind of an expert, kind of like we're doing these, uh, you can broadcast a demonstration. Uh, that's also pretty good. Uh, they like to see you in action. Um, one of the things for authors that we think is really cool is if you happen to be at a location of, of one of your books, maybe even one of your backlist books, uh, that can be a, another good place to use kind of Facebook Live. Uh, we do think you need to plan it in advance. Um, and like anything, give it a name that people are going to say, oh, I want to watch that. Um, and you want to make sure that you speak clearly, loudly. You're not broadcasting from a, a noisy location. Tonight, I noticed my family's here tonight. They we're leaving tomorrow, so everybody was home. I thought they were not gonna be around tonight. Uh, so we're getting a little bit of noise, so you wanna make sure you're up. Um, you can use both the front and fact-facing cameras uh, on your phone when you're broadcasting, so that can be pretty cool. So there's ways to kind of really do Facebook Live to make it work. Um, you do wanna invite them to subscribe, so the next time you're live, they can kind of come in. Um, Facebook Live is currently about 20 minutes, uh, so you wanna learn what times uh, appeal to your audience. Uh, if you're reading a chapter, 20 minutes may be fine, but if you're doing a location thing, that may be five minutes. Uh, 